Thanks very much. It's uh, great to be here today to talk to you about uh, groundwater and poverty. And on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, we put a definition of what water security is, because we thought we, we weren't quite sure what it was either. So here's a great definition. It's a reliable availability of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods and production with an acceptable level of water-related risks. So the three speakers today, it's not random that three of us here, because we're going to all tackle different aspects of that water security. I'm going to talk about the bit in bold there, which is water for health, livelihood and production. So, how does that work out with groundwater and poverty? Groundwater has been an amazing resource at reducing poverty around the world. And what I would like to discuss is the question is, how can groundwater be used to improve the water security of people, particularly in Africa. So I've got a, a slide there that shows some of the places that BGS are currently working uh, across the world looking at groundwater. And if I had more than the 15 minutes I've got just now, I'd have talked about our work in Asia. I was hoping to do that, but when I ran through the talk, I realised, hmm, can't do Asia as well as Africa. So I'm going to concentrate on the projects that we have in Africa at the moment, addressing this question of groundwater and how it can be used to help alleviate poverty. So there's still a big issue in the world in 2017 that 750 million approximately people do not have access to an improved uh, water supply. So we still have a huge number of the world's population who are taking the water from dugouts, from surface water, from little ponds, that are contaminated and uh, are, are very poor for people's health. So this is a, a huge issue around the world today and has lots of knock-on impacts for people's livelihoods. It's not just about the quality of water that people are drinking uh, leading to ill health. It's also about the amount of time it then takes people to go and collect that water. If you've got to walk two or three uh, kilometres to collect that water every day at the beginning or end of a day, then that's several hours that you could have been putting to more productive use that you're having to, to use to collect water. So again, impacting very much on people's ability to generate income and lift them out of poverty. And th these ladies here were in Benue State in Nigeria and had to walk about two or three kilometres to that source that I showed you beforehand, such such poor quality water. And this... Uh, uh, this uh, burden falls mainly on women and children, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. The, the woman there has decided she, she wants to carry more than the 20, the 20 uh, litres that the basin holds, so she's got some calabash, hollowed them out, so she can collect 30 litres of water at a time, which if you know your, your, how that translates to, to mass, that's 30 kilograms of uh, of uh, water that she's carrying on top of her head for these couple of kilometres. And look, she's, she's still smiling. So groundwater uh, appears to be a great answer to some of these burdens that are falling on people. If you can drill a well, drill a borehole to access that groundwater, maybe to 20 or 30 metres, put a hand pump on it, then, uh, then people have access to good quality water right next to the village and it can begin to help lift people out of out of poverty and help reduce the burden that water collection uh, takes every single day. And if you, if you like your information in terms of graphs rather than, than, than pictures, here's some work that we did a few years ago with a, a medic down in uh, University of East Anglia who had looked at the relation between infant mortality and uh, access or lack of access to clean water and showed a fairly clear relationship even if you accounted for GDP and access to healthcare and other issues. It still seemed to be that one of the best things a country could do to improve its health would be to improve access to clean water. So groundwater is pretty good for drinking water and uh, improving people's livelihoods in that regard. But what, also, uh, what about also for food production? Here's a, a picture from northern Nigeria, right in the border with Niger. I um, took this photograph looking one side of the road. You can see it's, 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 it's been... Uh, well, there's not much grass there, there's, there's not much productive use there at all. This is a picture looking the other way, turning around the other way. You have got some small-scale irrigation going on there by farmers who are hand-drilling down to maybe 5 or 10 metres, taking out some water and growing tomatoes and chilies for some uh, cash crops. 
beginning to make some income, beginning to lift them out of poverty. This is a particularly interesting case because if you go another 10 kilometers away from where I was there, you will find a large scale uh, industry coming in, commercial farmer, which is pulling out lots of water for pivot irrigation for maize. And there's a lot of interesting questions there about what maybe is the best use of that water for reducing poverty. Would it be the big uh, industrial uses here or some of the small artisanal water, water use? This also uh, brings to mind questions for East Africa at the moment. We're all aware that there is a, a severe drought there and a famine in parts of East, East Africa. And one of the reasons for that is a lack of rain uh, early in the season to begin to get crops to germinate. So small amounts of irrigation to, at the beginning of the growing season to help crops begin to grow would be maybe a great thing to, to look into and to try and uh, support throughout parts of East, uh, Ethiopia. And that's some work we're, we're doing at the moment as well. So, I hope you're all convinced now. Groundwater really is a, a, a triple A reserve for the world. It's a fantastic water resource. It's water that's stored naturally in the pore spaces of rocks like, like sandstones or in fractures and harder rocks like, like granites. You see the, the, the pictures of rocks down the right hand side. Oh, ooh, round the right hand side. And with the British Geological Survey, it's almost compulsory that I need to have a picture of some rocks. So these are the pictures of rocks in it. So you can find groundwater in lots of environments. It's not just the big uh, aquifers, the big sandstone aquifers, but lots of other environments as well in weathered crystalline rocks, etc. And it accounts for about a third of the world's global water abstraction at the moment. So I'm just going to run through some of the work that we've been doing at the Geological Survey at different scales to try and understand that groundwater resources, how, how to quantify, how to abstract it, where to find it, uh, and how to get the most out of it. This is some work we did to map groundwater resources across the whole of the continent of Africa, where we, based on the geological maps and adding in lots of hydrogeological, specialist hydrological information and maps, lots of detailed studies that we systematically analysed, then a few new studies that we, we did ourselves at, at, at BGS. We came up with these uh, maps of uh, this map of groundwater storage for across Africa. And if you can see there, uh, blue, the darker blue means more groundwater storage. And overall, the groundwater storage or availability for Africa is very high. This is, the amount there, half a million cubic kilometers, is about 30 times the amount you get annually in the rivers and, and lakes of Africa. It's a huge resource. But you can see it's also dominated by the North African basins, where it's not really of much use. If you've got all that water in the middle of the Sahara, it's not really economically viable to pump that out and, and ship it anywhere else. But if you look even at the light blue areas where there's less storage, the work that we've done there shows that you, you, in these areas with less groundwater storage, you probably still have enough to sustain a hand pump <coughs> over several years, two or three years, is enough groundwater, maybe five years, to sustain a hand pump. So even in the lowest storage areas of granites and gneisses and uh, hard rocks, you can get groundwater storage to sustain hand pumps over several years. Another thing we've looked at is how much water can you, you pull out? So if you drill a well, could you sustain one of these pivot, pivot irrigators, the, like the middle diagram there, or is it only for a hand pump? And what we find is for a lot of Africa, uh, it will be very difficult to sustain one of these big pivot irrigators. So if you have the big multinationals or international companies or organisations <laughs> looking to develop very large scale irrigation, you can only do that in very small parts of the continent. Most of the areas, it's going to be small yields of groundwater at any one time because the rocks aren't quite permeable enough to pull out more water. So groundwater, lots of groundwater storage, it's a great thing. But there are several nagging questions about groundwater looking into the future, and this is one of them. How will groundwater respond to increased climate variability and increasing abstraction? So maybe it's okay at the moment, but what will happen if the climate changes? What happens if we start taking out an awful lot more? I think it's quite helpful just to look at a, a, a year in the life of a, a village well in Nigeria. So this, is a, this again is in Benue State in, in Nigeria, it's, it's one year, and down the left hand side you have got depth below ground level of the, of the water table. And you can see how it, uh, during the rainy season the water levels rise very rapidly. Towards the end of the, the rainy season they're not rising so rapidly but they're not falling, the water's not being used very much, 
But during the dry season, this well gets used a huge amount, and the water levels plummet here until actually there's very little water at all. But then they recover during the rainy season. So something we're trying to do uh, as hydrogeologists is trying to quantify this recharge to groundwater. How quickly will it recover after it rains? What's the link between rainfall and groundwater? So some work where we're just finishing off at the moment uh, is relating rainfall to groundwater recharge, how quickly or how much uh, groundwater is, is, uh, is replenished. So along the, the bottom axis here, you've got rainfall per year in a, up to 1,000 millimetres per year. Up the left hand, uh, the, the, the vertical axis, you've got recharge. And you can see there's more or less a broad relationship there. More rainfall, more groundwater recharge. But look at the, the, the variability, over an order of magnitude. There's a lot of complex things going on here. For the same rainfall, you might not get the same replenishment. So we're doing a lot of work trying to investigate what is it to do with the land use, what is it to do with the geology, uh, that will, what is it to do with intensity of rainfall that will control groundwater recharge. So there's several methods that we're kind of looking at to, to, to try and investigate that. One is uh, using satellites. Now this is the grey satellite which got a a huge footprint of about 400 by 400 kilometers. So it, it, it's, it's seeing over a very, very broad scale. And people have used it in northern India to show groundwater depletion. And we've been looking at using it across, across the continent. These are the basins, the main, main, grind, main, the main sedimentary aquifers uh, in Africa. And it's got a resolution of about five millimeters, so a very small amount of, of water. And what we've found using this analysis is that actually the only trend we see with groundwater recharge over the last 10 years are, is that that groundwater levels have been accumulating rather than falling. So there isn't lots of groundwater uh, depletion across Africa. What we're finding at this scale is actually accumulation. So that raises some questions, which I'm not going to answer just now. Another technique that we're, we're particularly fond of at the moment is to use or to look at groundwater residence times. So that's using some novel techniques to try and work out how long the groundwater has been in the ground? When did it fall as rainfall? Was it this year, this current season? Is that when it fell as rainfall? Uh, uh, or the stuff we're pumping out, was it during Alex Ferguson's reign at Manchester United the last 20 or 30 years? Or even longer ago, in the bright and shiny days of, of Labour in the 1990s? Or in the heyday of Scottish football in the 1970s? Go Kenny. Or what about 500 years ago, Mary Queen of Scots? Is the groundwater we're pumping out that old? Or what about 2,000 years ago when Hadrian's Wall was still keeping the English out of Scotland? <laughs> so the techniques that we, that we use uh, look at, are looking at dissolved gases in groundwater. So you can see a hand, hand pump there which we're instrumenting up, looking at some <coughs> dissolved gases, measuring lots of, lots of things uh, to do with anthropogenic gases, CFCs and SF6, to try and get a handle of these residence times. And just to, get, just to finish really with some of, the, some of the results that we're finding from this. Uh, if you look at this, this well, this Nigerian well, six metres deep, six, uh, yeah, about six metres deep, the groundwater that, was, uh, that we're pumping out of that, that was recharged only last year. So it's very vulnerable to drought. If there's a bad rainy season, then it'll dry up. It's also then very vulnerable to contamination because pathogen, you know, pathogens can rapidly move to that well. If we think of this, uh, this borehole with a hand pump on it, this is maybe 30 to 40 metres. Uh, here we find that the water is a mix of ages over the last kind of 50 years. And we did a transect from southern Nigeria right up through Niger and into Burkina Faso uh, along, along to, towards the west. And there we found more or less similar answers, a mix of, of uh, groundwater ages, which makes it very resilient to try out. And I'm just going to use these techniques uh, at the moment in, in Ethiopia over the last six months and the next year to look at the ages of groundwater for springs and boreholes there at the moment to try and help advise UNICEF and the government there what, uh, what abstraction techniques, what technologies should they promote to try and make communities more resilient to drought. So that's techniques we're using at the moment to try and advise in that situation. I'm going to leave out Asia. I shouldn't have tried to put it in. And I'm just going to summarise this now. So I hope, I, I hope you're now aware, if you weren't beforehand, how fundamental groundwater is to, to the world's water security. And that, they're, that developing these groundwater resources really is a great way of improving people's livelihoods and their health. 
and ultimately to reducing poverty. poverty. But it's a very complex resource. It's out of sight, sometimes out of mind. So we need a lot more work to, to help develop this groundwater sustainably into the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alan. So um, I'm moving a bit further down the, uh, in there, but down the, or along the definition of um, water security and focusing, focusing very much on the quality of water and pretty much focusing on the quality of surface waters, which is uh, where the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology tend to do uh, most of their work, leaving the groundwaters to British Geological Survey. I'm going to be talking particularly about innovation in monitoring water quality and how we can do that in very low cost ways. So just to start, to sort of highlight that um, how we use fresh water is very universal. Um, and so clearly we know we use it for drinking water is a fundamental need. Um, but then also in very large parts of the world, fish production, uh, food production is a really critical part of what we get from our surface waters. Um, on the top left uh, box there, you can see a, a hydropower system. And again, that's a really hugely a growing area across the developing world, a hydropower developments. And, and so uh, impacting on how those fresh waters operate and uh, water availability. And then finally, the bottom right, this is a, a cheeky wee monkey um, in Italy, actually. But, uh, but just highlighting the fact that actually many people, many children just like to play in water as well. So recreation and tourism are really important parts of um, water use right around the world, whether that's developing or developed world. So really critical sort of universal things that we, we require from fresh waters. But then when we look at fresh water quality, that is not so universal. So here in uh, the developed world, we've got nice reservoirs, we've got very functional water treatment works. Most of our drinking water is uh, treated water. In Scotland, there are private water supplies that aren't so much, but they tend to be in fairly undisturbed, unpolluted catchments. Um, whereas, as Alan showed, some of the surface waters that people exploit in the developing world are really not waters you would want to uh, drink from or play in or wash in or whatever those activities that go in go on often in the same place so i'm going to start just to talk with how we monitor fresh waters in europe uh, this is ian gunn this is loch leven the site we go to every two weeks and we've been doing that for the last 50 years uh, to understand how climate change and how land use change impacts on our freshwater quality um, in Europe, we have the Water Framework Directive. Um, it's been a piece of legislation since the year 2000. And the crucial thing about it is the way it changed how we monitor the quality of waters. So we now use a lot of biological information to monitor the health of our fresh waters, the ecological health. And we use four main groups. So uh, the algae, the phytoplankton at the top, macrophytes, and the algae associated with those plants. Um, and particularly in rivers and streams, we use the algae more because you don't often see the, the plants in, in fast-flowing streams. Benthic invertebrates, uh, so um, caddisflies, mayfly larvae, water beetles, those sorts of things have been widely used for quite a few decades now. Uh, and fish as well. Fish monitoring isn't used so extensively in the UK, but across Europe it's used more widespread. But in the UK, it's not because of, um, it's often a, a destructive sampling method to survey fish populations. So we do have, still use some of these sort of um, more sort of traditional uh, water quality measures. So nutrients and water clarity, oxygen conditions, they're still monitored, but they're very much used as supporting information as to the ecological health of our fresh waters. And the reason for that is that biological monitoring really integrates uh, the quality of our waters in relation to a wide number of pressures. So in terms of thousands of different chemical pollutants, in terms of hydrological pressures, and in terms of um, morphological pressures, so changes in channelization and dams and things like that. That biology integrates across all those pressures that fresh waters um, are impacted by. 
And they also integrate over time. So where, if you were doing chemical monitoring of a, a river, trying to find a pollution event, you really would have to be there at the time of the pollution event. Whereas you can go to a river, look at the invertebrates, and actually a month later you'll still see that community is impacted by that pollution event a month earlier. So it really is a useful way of it, um, monitoring. So I don't know, what, can I get rid of that little green box in any way? No? Press the pointer. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Um, so how we do that in the Water Framework Directive, we have five quality classes from bad to high. And the crucial thing is, is that it's measured as some, a deviation from a reference or an undisturbed state. And so we have a challenge as biologists, as ecologists, to work out well, what is an undisturbed state in, in relation to all these biological groups. We have to also do it for different components of those biological groups. So the community composition, the abundance of them, and for phytoplankton work that I'm particularly involved in, the frequency and intensity of algal blooms. So we need to know what's the baseline state for all our rivers and locks in terms of those components. And so that was quite a challenge from 2000, and it's taken about five to ten years to develop all these schemes for um, plants, invertebrates, fish and algae. Um, we've been doing this not isolated in Scotland or in uh, the UK as a whole, but we've been doing it across Europe, and we have to show that our assessment schemes are comparable with other countries across Europe. So there was a really large compar comparison um, uh, initiative across Europe to make sure that we were um, saying what is good status is, is comparable and what is high status because these are the two targets in the Water Framework Directive. You have to try and achieve good, good ecological status and not deteriorate if your site is already in high status. And we also have to say how confident we are in that classification. And so you will see if you go onto the CEPA website, it will say this is good status and we are Low, have low confidence in that or high confidence in that. If you drill down a bit more into some of those CEPA websites, you can actually get a percentage on that confidence. So you can, it may say it's 75% confident. So these are all the sorts of ways we have to quantify uh, our biological information, and it really was quite a challenge to do that. But what we end up with are maps like this. This is maps of uh, the quality of locks in Scotland. And the one on the uh, left is um, rivers in Scotland, but only showing those rivers that are uh, not achieving good status at the moment. And you can see there is a, a e real east-west split. Um, so with the sort of sites not achieving good status generally on the east coast and in the central lowlands, and the high and good status sites more on the west coast, linked to obviously land use and population densities. But these are the sorts of figures we see Roughly uh, a third of locks not achieving good status, and about 45% of rivers not achieving good status. But coastal waters, um, uh, a much lower percentage not achieving good status. So there's still plenty of work to be done. I have to say, you, Scotland is actually one of the highest achievers in, in Europe, if you look at this. Compared to, um, say, England, about 80 to 90% of sites are failing good status in England. So it's actually a fairly good picture but you can still see that there's a, a widespread need to uh, improve the quality. So that's Europe and Scotland in particular. And then uh, moving on to the sustainable development goals, um, that changes, gives us a slightly different perspective in terms of what we want to measure for quality. And I'm going to talk about goal six, uh, clean water. And this is, comes from the UN Water, uh, a guidance on indicators <coughs> and targets. And, so I'll just be focusing on one of the targets within Goal 6, uh, water quality. And you can see the target is to achieve by 2030 improved water quality. Um, and the way to, uh, they aim to achieve that is to increase the uh, proportion of untreated wastewater, so to halve the amount of untreated wastewater. And so there's a couple of um, targets or indicators associated with that. But at the moment, they are fairly undefined percentage of water bodies with good water quality. So there's a current project, UN project, reviewing the sort of water quality indicators that could be adopted and could be used to uh, measure um, the progress towards these sustainable development goals. And it's a project run by um, a German university, uh, United Nations Centre, 
and I'm involved in the fringes in terms of providing uh, advice and stuff. Basically, uh, because of my involvement in, in a lot of the European assessment schemes. But um, where we're starting at, uh, we are particularly th focusing on this purpose question, which will be very different from the European Water Framework Directive, but um, also this last bullet point, the cost. The cost is really crucial to um, many countries that we're involved in. Um, you know, it re they really don't have the um, amounts of money that we have in this country. Actually, and even in this country, we are struggling to <coughs> monitor just a fraction of our waters, really, because of the cost. So we may learn a lot from what we're doing overseas and, and, and be able to translate that and bring that back to the UK. So in terms of purpose, it's clear that there are some very different priorities in, um, with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, um, as we've heard, pathogens associated and health uh, diseases associated with water. This is the map of cholera uh, incidents uh, where um, sources of cholera and you can see that large areas of sub-Saharan Africa and many areas of Asia and Latin America are all problem areas for cholera because of this large proportion of untreated water. Also, fisheries. We need to have indicators that will tell you what the health of the fish fishery is as well as the health of the human population. So again, that's really important in terms of what indicators are best for that. And just this sort of illustrates, this is the record trout caught at uh, Loch Leven in 2013. Um, and what's important is that actually the Sustainable Development Goals apply to our country as well as overseas. So it's, it's, they are globally um, important. And it's an issue that we have to think about in this country as well. Are our fisheries sustainable or not? And it's a question that we tackle at, at Loch Leven. And then finally, um, you know, the use of water for recreation and tourism is, an, again, another important aspect that we need to contemplate. So in terms of monitoring, well, probably the cheapest tool for monitoring is the Secchi disk. And this was invented by um, the late Father Secchi. He was one of the Pope's chief scientists uh, in the 19th century. He was actually an uh, astronomer, ast astrophysicist, interested in light uh, out in space, but he had a stint as an oceanographer, as you do, you just quickly change disciplines uh, when he moved to the States, and he invented this very simple black and white disc that you lower down into the water, and when it disappears, that tells you something about the, the clarity, the turbidity, the amount of suspended solids, the amount of algal biomass there. And it's still something we use every two weeks at Loch Leven, um, and we have a, a really nice time series that is, is used as a, it's one of our key indicators of water quality over the, over the 50 years. It's really used widely across um, both oceanography and in, in fresh waters. And there is even a, 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 Nash, a, a month uh, for Secchi uh, disc measurement. So we have a World Water Day, but actually July of every year is, is Secchi disc month, where everyone is supposed to go out and measure the water clarity in their local lake or pond or, or coastal beach. So do join in the uh, great Secchi Dipping uh, and contribute data at the website. So it was Father Secchi who really started citizen monitoring all those years ago, but things have moved on and we're now in the smartphone age and uh, in CEH we're very involved in citizen science um, for two reasons. One, it engages the public in the management of their fresh waters or the management of their environment. And secondly, it provides data in a very cost-effective way. And even in the developing world, a lot of people now have smartphones. And so we're developing stuff in, in Tanzania and India uh, associated with that. This is our new app that's almost out. It's coming out soon. Blooming Algae is our newly designed app logo that's uh, designed from a quick tweet to someone. Can anyone design us a logo? And we got it within a day or two. But um, so this app's been developed with SEPA and Health Protection Scotland uh, to really give very rapid monitoring of algal bloom problems uh, around our lake. So these algae produce very severe neurotoxins um, and, and so it does restrict usage of the lake uh, and particularly for dog walkers and people with young children. And that data will go, be publicly available on the lakes portal. It will be publicly available to SEPA and Public Health Scotland. 
and, and they will be able to react to uh, and go and sample to check whether those are true records or not. So uh, look out for this. It will be launched properly in summer. And then the third, um, last one that I wanted to talk about was satellite monitoring, which doesn't sound like a cheap way of monitoring data, but we now have these new European satellites, Sentinel-2 and 3, which provide data free. That's the whole uh, aspect to, behind them. And we've got a, a project called, uh, funded by the Natural Environment Research Council called Globo Lakes, which is a consortium of four Scottish universities led by Stirling and two of the NERC Research Councils, us and Plymouth Marine Labs. And we're, with this, we're monitoring a thousand of the largest lakes around the world for water quality using these new satellites and, and some older satellites. And these lakes are often in places that are very hard to access for monitoring or in places where they just don't have the mo money to monitor. This is an example, this is Lake Turkana in Kenya, uh, Kenyan Ugandan border. And this is the data that we've got from the satellite. This is the uh, average chlorophyll monthly means for the 10 year period for the whole lake integrated for the whole lake. And so that's some really useful little data product that we can pass on to monitor whether you've got more nutrient problems, more algal bloom problems, or, or, or whether things are improving. But you can see there's actually 80,000 pixels in this, uh, of this lake that we're getting from the satellite. Every three to five days or so, we're getting this information. So we can gather all that data and start to think, well, where are the problems spatially in these large lakes across Africa and elsewhere? And you can see here, this is the data that's been transformed through statistics into four different regional zones within the lake. So we've got the red zone, which is most of the lake, and you can see that has very, very low levels of chlorophyll, not much seasonality. But you can see in the north basin, right at the uh, top there, you have extremely high levels of chlorophyll um, and so a very different system that you're dealing with. So it just shows you the, the potential information you can get from satellites, which are much better than us taking one sample from the middle of the lake once a month or so. We could potentially have a lot more data. And then final slide, um, that was about how we monitor water quality. The question is how do we use that data to actually manage our fresh waters uh, differently? And, and this slide was taken from the front cover of the Guardian, not the front cover, uh, an article in the Guardian, and you can't see it so well in this light, but this is a lake where the lake is on fire, and it just highlights the quality problems that we are actually dealing with in, in the developed world are a different ballpark to what we've got in Europe, really, and, and how we're trying to... Uh, this is Bangalore in, in India, and where we're trying to set up a monitoring scheme of, of, of some quite new, innovative management techniques for linked treatment works with constructed wetlands, algal ponds, low-cost methods for, for managing the pollution, and then a low-cost monitoring system around that to, to see whether that's effective and that effectiveness of that system and whether it needs to be maintained. So I'm going to leave it there. That's all I'm going to say on water quality and pass over to Lindsay for the final part. So oh, yeah, thank you and good evening. Um, so I'm going to take over and talk about the last part of the, the definition that we have highlighted here. So I'm going to concentrate on the bit in red, acceptable level of water related risks. And I'm going to focus mainly or only actually on flood related risks. Although you could also look at the other extreme which is droughts. But this will focus only on flood related. I'm going to show you a few of the quite famous pictures from recent events, courtesy of Lawrence. He did mention that I forgot to put his name on the picture. But these are pictures from the River Tweed and Aberdeenshire, the River Dee, following post-storm uh, Frank. Okay. What we can see with these pictures is that floods impact people, they impact livelihoods, and Quite importantly, they impact uh, linking infrastructure. So that's the A96 that links Aberdeen um, along the River Dee. And the River Dee has taken that out and therefore cut off communities for a certain period of time during that. 
But it wasn't just recent, it's not just 2015, 2016. It may feel like we're in a particularly flood-rich period, but these flood events have been going on for a long period of time. This is from the White Cart Water, 94, 2002. But they're also across Europe and pictures across the world. So these are pictures from Mozambique uh, when the Limpopo flooded in 2000. And what we can see is that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the impact of floods are the same. They devastate communities. They cut off people from one side to the other. So you can see linking infrastructures being cut off by rivers. And they uh, impact people's homes and people's livelihoods. So it's not just a UK challenge. I've got some numbers here. On uh, this side, we have 2015 um, for the UK. Over 3,000 victims, that was principally from Storm Desmond, Eva and Frank, and about five, million, five billion pounds worth of damages. In 2015 alone, though, across the world, we saw 36.2 million victims. To put that into context, that's kind of like half of the population of the UK. And $23.3 billion worth of um, damages, which is significant. So this is a significant challenge, significant issue, and one that plays into the water security problem. And when we talk about floods, we, we use lots and lots of different words, but when I'm talking about them, I tend to talk about water uh, flood hazard. That's, to me, that's the flow, the actual water in a river or coming from rainfall. The exposure, then where does that water go? So what, what is exposed to that water? Does it come out a bank from a river? And also the resilience, flood resilience. So how resilient is a community or a system or a, a city, their ability to bounce back, to prepare, respond or recover? And we can have, well, we can think about floods in terms of the challenge, and that's always against a backdrop of climate change and rapid urbanisation. So climate change, um, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but depending on our different um, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emission scenarios, we think we may well end up with wetter, warmer climate. What you can see in this graph here, I'm not going to use the pointer because of the green box issue, but here we go, um, on, on the vertical scale we have carbon dioxide emissions and along here we have time. And what you can see is the various ranges of potential scenarios in the future. But we think it, we're going to end up wetter and warmer and that most likely will lead to an increase in flood hazard. On top of that we have rapid urbanisation. 2007 marked the point at which half of the world's population was centred in urban uh, areas. We're now moving towards a figure of about 80% of the world's population being focused in urban areas. More people in a smaller area with greater risk or greater hazards from floods gives us a great challenge. Some work we've done here at Heriot Watt, some of our research, is we've tried to look at quantifying the change to that future flood hazard. So here, just looking at the change to future flood flows, okay? So on this side, we have the baseline. So here is what we estimate to be um, a 1 in 100 year flow event. That means a an event which has an annual probability of 1%. You may see it, one you have a 1% probability in one year of seeing it. What you can see on the west is you have wetter catchments, and on the east we have drier catchments. That's how the rain falls in this country. This figure here shows us our percentage change in the future, in the 2080s. What you can see, so this working from this scale here, we have some catchments in yellow where we don't think there'll be that much of a change to that one in 100 year event. But in the darker blues, we're picking up catchments where we're looking at a potential change of 25 to 50% on your annual, uh, on your 1 in 100 year event. So that's an extra 50% of flow into rivers. We then did the same for Scotland. We did it on a more extreme event, on a 0.5% probability event. And again, on this side, you can see 
the baseline, so wet catchments in the red, green catchments at the drier catchments on the east, and then the percentage change in the future. And what you can see again is that the catchments in orange are picking up about a 25 to 50 percent increase in flood flows, which is a significant change. Imagine adding 50 percent onto the rivers that you already see. But that's the change to the magnitude. What does that mean in terms of frequency? So what might a 1 in 200 year event, so a 0.5% probability event this year, in any given year, look like in the future? Does it become more frequent? And so what we did was we mapped the probabilities of seeing that. The top right hand corner, you have the 1 in 10 year event, so the 10% probability. 30 year, 50 year, so the 2% probability in any year, and the 100 year, so the 1%. What you can see at the low return period is that we have a very low probability that the frequency will get to the point that we're seeing a 10% probability in any given year of, of a current 1 in 200 year event. Here in the red, the one in 50 year event, what you can see is that some catchments in the UK, a one in 200 year event now is more like a one in 50 year event in the future. And what that means is that we're four times as likely to see what we think of as an extreme event in the future. And then as you move to uh, the one in 100 year event, you can see that more catchments become red. So they become twice as likely. So we're seeing a change in magnitude and potentially a change in frequency too. But what does that mean? That's the hazard, that's the flow. Does that actually mean that we could end up with a more exposed population? Do we see that same extreme change in flow, meaning the same change to inundation in the rivers, or when the rivers come out of bank? And here we did a little bit of work looking at the River Don from the Park Bridge coming down past Dice um, and before it flows down through and out in Aber at Aberdeen. And what's interesting to see is that that 52% increase in hazard actually transpired when you look at mapping it on the ground. We start to see some areas become more, um, uh, more exposed, but actually a 50% increase in hazard only transpires as a 27% increase in exposure. So there's a slightly less of an extreme impact. But if we only look at climate change, we, we've accepted here now that we've got future increase to hazard as well as to exposure, we're kind of forgetting half of the problem because I also said we had the, the challenge of rapid urbanisation. So with the rapid urbanisation, we have the issue of newly exposed populations New people, new people moving to the area, also this extra exposure. But as engineers, we have been for years and years building defences. And people, when they live behind those defences, start to feel safer, which is great. But we didn't think about some of the emergent properties of building these defences. So we forgot how people might respond to that. If you live behind a defence, you start to feel safe and your ability to prepare, respond and recover reduces. So your resilience reduces. And if we forget about that, then we forget about how, um, how we forget how to respond and we, we lose our resilience. And we can see that, for example, with Hurricane Katrina and also with the Cumbrian floods most recently through Carlisle, where people were behind the defences, the defences were overtopped, and yet they were still impacted. So we need to recognise that this system is not just about the physical system, but it's also about the human system. And it's very much a coupled physical-human environment. And when we design engineering defences, we need to bear that in mind. And here I use the, the term vulnerability, so flood vulnerability. And the, what I'm using here to define it is the extent to which a system is susceptible 
to floods due to its exposure and its ability to cope, recover or adapt. So it's resilience. And we need to think of those three components when we're looking at ways to improve our resilience, our, uh, in, reduce our vulnerability. So is there another way to look at defences? Is there another way for us engineers to think about designing the future? And this is based on a bit of work that we've been doing here at Heriot Watt, which is using a systems approach to recognise the interdependencies in things like urban areas, to look at the, the city system, and rather than ask what it does, ask what it could do. How could we improve the system to engineer um, better resilience? And we applied this um, systems approach for Scottish towns, and we analysed the different components. So we looked at lots of different metrics which look at the interdependencies of different components. And we analysed them for exposure, where the flood is, susceptibility, the predisposition of who or what is in its way, and the resilience, the ability of the system to bounce back. And when you do that, it kind of looks a bit like this. Um, but the most important message that came out of that is that while we focus a lot on exposure, actually looking at susceptibility and resilience is at least as important and dealing with susceptibility and resilience is at least as important. So how do we do that? We can look, at a di we can look elsewhere for ideas to improve our susceptibility, to reduce our susceptibility, if you like. This is some work we did on the Mekong floodplain, where we looked at water-resilient, cheap, cost-effective, water-resilient infrastructure. The Mekong is flooded between four and six weeks a year, and people depend for their livelihoods um, on th that water. So it's absolutely essential that it continues to flood. But the communities need to remain connected. So we looked at very simple things like looking at raised roads, ensuring that the water can still pass underneath, um, but making sure that the roads don't wash away in floods by using very simple um, scour protection with vegetation. Portland in the USA is a very good example of reducing susceptibility within urban areas, so looking at water sensitive urban design. Now actually, as far as I'm aware, this was um, principally for water quality reasons, but it's had excellent benefits from water quantity perspective. So what they've done here, they've retrofitted green areas into pieces of infrastructure. So you can see it here, the railway lines, beside the roads, um, where it allows the water to soak away and therefore infiltrate into the ground and into the groundwater, improve the water quality, um, but also reduce flood risk. And we can retrofit these into urban areas. Another example here from Portland, USA, where we, where we start to work with urban rivers, but also mirrored very strongly about what in the Netherlands, where they have um, employed a making space for water program, where they set back the rivers, so they reduce the susceptibility of the people living beside these um, rivers. They provide more um, area for the water to flood in and make them prettier. So you're connecting, potentially looking for multiple benefits, so you can improve water quality, water quantity, ecological considerations, as well as improving blue-green health, so how people feel when they are beside rivers and waters um, and, and green areas, all reducing susceptibility. And then one excellent example where we can look at how we increase our own resilience. So what we did in Malawi and Kenya looked at trying to understand vulnerability to floods, different components that um, map the vulnerability to floods. And what was really interesting there is that while the social vulnerability was similar in as far as it, they were very strongly vulnerable to floods, there was a large population of young people, old people, um, and a significant illiterate population, what they did have was excellent social capital. 
and social capability, which offset this vulnerability to improve their resilience. So things like um, decentralized institutions, things like um, novel and uh, clever early warning systems such as drumming and text messaging, things like um, great education in the schools, in uh, great public awareness because there was great interconnectivity between people and um, the, the communities. They were able to respond to emergency events very, very quickly. They were really nimble. So these are maybe some things that we can take forward to increase our own resilience, to reduce our own susceptibility. So what might water resilient cities look like in the future? We need to think about connected resilient infrastructure and look at those interconnections. I've talked about some very low cost resilient infrastructure. There's much more clever, um, clever ways to look at infrastructure and I know that that's going on. Look at water resilient design, water resilient urban design where we can retrofit but also recognize and enhance multiple benefits when they go on. But most importantly is to increase the social capital, get people working together, get people more resilient. And all of those things together can start making us um, more, more, water, uh, more flood resilient. So I just want to raise a few thanks and uh, put some nice pictures up of all the people I've worked with and I've used their work with there today. Um, and yeah, I think that's us and we would like to invite questions. <laughs>